Hello, welcome. I'm glad, so glad you can join us, that you can join me across time and space. I have a question for you. What number is this? What number is this? If I asked you this question, you would probably say it's a six. Yes, would you say it's a six? Hmm. But if I look at it, what if I said it's not a six? That's not a six. Doesn't look like a six to me. You and I would disagree on what this number is. If we disagree, does that mean that we can't be friends? Does that mean that we can't work together or worship together or be together? Let's explore how we can disagree without being disagreeable as we worship across time and space together. There's so many of us that have been doing church differently. Our Sunday mornings, our worship perhaps, has become a bit more casual. And instead of gathering in buildings, we gather in living rooms, at dining room tables, in safe spaces, and in safe places. Now these safe places have become our own sanctuaries, and even fellowship has a different and sometimes less personal touch. Yes, we miss the old ways of doing things, and it hasn't been easy gathering, worshiping, learning, even being the church. But now, more than ever, we're reminded of the simple truth. Now, more than ever, we're reminded that the church is not a building. It's the body of Christ. It isn't built with brick and mortar, but with faith and hope and love. In the midst of uncertainty, our calling remains the same, to share the truth of the gospel with a world that God loves. Throughout history, the church has prospered in difficult times, and today is no different. We are still the church. We're just doing things a bit differently. And so, we welcome you. Welcome to worship. So welcome. Welcome once again to Worship with Caledonia Presbyterian Church. My name is Pastor Janice Doyle, and it really is a privilege and a blessing to have you join us across time and space as we continue to gather virtually instead of physically in these times. We do hope to reopen our church doors, our sanctuary doors soon. We are in the process of uh, some renovations that are coming along. And we hope that once things are a little more safe, that uh, we would be so blessed to invite you back in person to worship. But let's worship together virtually. And as we prepare our hearts and minds to do that, I invite you to pause and breathe. Let's try and clear our minds, clear our hearts, clear our thoughts as we settle into our safe spaces. Breathe in and breathe out. We're going to play a little piece of music to allow us to focus as we prepare to worship together. Give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. We've seen God's wondrous works all around us, and so we come to praise God's holy name. 
May we open wide our hearts and minds in this time of worship. Let's pray. Holy and gracious God, source of life and love, we gather in your presence to wonder at the beauty and complexity of all you have made, acknowledging how small and insignificant we are each on our own. And yet, you love us with a promise that gives us significance and restores our purpose in the midst of the creation you love. When we are overcome by forces around us, you speak words of peace. When trouble or sorrow sets in, you give us the strength we need to persevere. In this time of worship, O oh God, we remember all you have been, all you are, and all you will be, offering you all praise and honor, our love and our loyalty, with our lips and with our lives to the end of our days. Mighty and merciful God, you are the source of hope and wholeness, and yet we confess that we fail you far too often. You call us to serve in the footsteps of Jesus, but so often we look to our own interests first. You call us to love our neighbors, all of our neighbors, but we're so good at finding fault in others and even withholding our love. We allow disagreements to turn into conflict and we allow conflict to conflict with our love. Lord, you call us to do justice and care for the vulnerable and there are times we are silent. We don't take a stand for fear of risk. Forgive us, Lord, for this and more. We lay it all at the foot of the cross. Amen. My friends, do hear and believe the good news of the gospel in Jesus Christ. God's generous love reaches out to embrace us. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and we're set free to begin again. Let us give thanks for God's love and may we share it with our neighbors. We are a forgiven people. Thanks be to God. Ah, so we're going to get into the holy words of scripture. The Apostle Paul has a lot of good sound advice in his letters to the many churches. Today we're going to turn to the letter to the Romans, and we have Grant Ashbaugh reading for us the first part of chapter 14. And so as we prepare to read and listen to Holy Scripture, let's pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as these scriptures are read, and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. So let's hear these words of scripture. Accept one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything. But another, whose faith is weak, eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand for the Lord is able to make them stand. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so 
to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. Disagreements, conflict, arguments. Hmm. As long as people have been getting together, conflict and conflict resolution has been a part of living since almost the beginning of our existence. And keep in mind that having a disagreement does not mean that there is automatically conflict. Disagreements can actually be a good thing. Disagreements can give us perspective. Disagreements give us options. Disagreements give room for growth. But sometimes, sometimes disagreements do turn into something more. Disagreements have turned to anger. Anger turns to bitterness. And this is what often causes relationships to break down in our personal relationships, in our workplaces, and even in our churches. People have left and people will leave. And so in our time together, we're going to explore possible ways of dealing with disagreements based on the advice given by the Apostle Paul in this very reading we have, the letter to the Romans. Why do people disagree? Why do people leave? Why do they leave a family or a social group or a workplace? Reasons vary. Why do they leave a church? Did you know, a little bit of history here, did you know that when Martin Luther proposed his 95 theses in 1517, he did not want the church to split. When he proposed a list of reformations that actually split the Catholic Church and began what we call the Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther actually wanted the church to reform. He wanted the church to change, not to splinter into pieces. And it certainly wasn't his intention to create a Lutheran denomination or even any of the denominations we have today. But because he promoted these change, because he disagreed with the church, the church fragmented. It split. Was this a good thing or a bad thing? Is there really a clear-cut answer? Now, you know, unfortunately, people have left the church over a whole list of things. Usually, it can be a change in doctrine or, or a differing in theology, from opening the communion table, infant baptisms, the ordination of women, inclusivity. But people have also left the church because of the color of the paint used in a sanctuary. I've heard stories recently that included people leaving a congregation because a picnic table was installed on the church property or because a pot machine was placed in a church fellowship hall. I've heard of people leaving the church because a flag in the sanctuary was moved. The list I could share is actually quite extensive. But you know what, Paul, Paul gives us some good advice on disagreeing. So let's start right there at the beginning in verse 1. Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. Here we're actually called to welcome, to accept, to welcome those who might disagree with you. On any matter, there can be two sides and sometimes even more. But we can accept one another, even with our differing viewpoints. 
And that brings us right into the next few verses where Paul gives the examples of foods. Those who have freedom of conscience to choose must not look down on those who don't. We read it there in verse 3. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does. For God has accepted them. Now, it seems perhaps maybe Paul is chastising those on both sides of the legalism debate. One ought not look down on the other. You know, I have a couple of friends who are vegan. They will not eat any meat products, and I love them wholeheartedly. But I also like to eat a nice juicy steak or a pork chop or hamburgers. You know where I'm going. But that doesn't mean that I lord my meat eating over my friends. There are people who believe that a vegan lifestyle isn't truly healthy. And there are people who believe that a vegan lifestyle is truly healthy. Who's right? But moreover, who am I to judge? And I especially love the end of that verse, for God has accepted them. Hmm. I have another friend, actually, who happens to be an alcoholic. And I myself love to have a nice glass of wine or even a vodka cooler. Do I chastise them and say, oh, it's okay to have one? Of course not. I don't lord it over them. I don't treat them with contempt just because they don't drink. I love them. And God loves them. It is not up to me to judge those who have a freedom to choose and the liberty to do so should never judge or condemn another. If someone might appear to have a weaker conscience on an issue, it's always tempting to pass judgment and tell people how they ought to believe or how they ought to feel. And it's so tempting for us to make a case for our own argument. Perhaps you might have even heard something along the lines of, how can a person be a Christian and do that? Don't they know they're not supposed to do it for Christ's sake? Don't they know they're supposed to give it up for Christ? Hmm. Paul tells us that the strong in faith should not look down on those who might seem to have a weaker faith or conscience, those who might seem to be at a different path on their own faith journeys. And you know what? The same holds true, vice versa. I love that there in verse four. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? Do we really have the right to reject someone that God has welcomed? Now, I've heard stories not only of people leaving a church because of a female pastor was called, but I've been hearing other stories and different pastors, and these are different denominations, that uh, people left a particular church because the female minister didn't wear pantyhose every Sunday. I'm not making this stuff. I kid you not. Another reason why somebody left the church, a family left the church, Because the woman preacher wore red shoes on Communion Sunday. Hmm. Yeah. Now, you know, the first real schism in the church wasn't that Protestant Reformation brought about by Martin Luther. There were actually others. There's what's called the Papal Schism in 1378. It was also called the Vatican Standoff, as well as the Western Schism. (laughs) There were political factions and alliances, and believe it or not, there were two popes at the time, Pope Urban and Pope Clement. They'd been voted in by the cardinals, and the schism within the church, and actually even most of Europe, didn't end until nearly 40 years later, one pope calling the other the anti-pope. Earlier still, in the year 1054, the church split over theological and political differences, resulting in two churches, the Catholic Church 
and the Eastern Orthodox Church. Now, back then, the Greek churches were forced to conform to Latin practices, and they were told that if they didn't, they would be forced to close. And one of the arguments at that time was over the power and the polity of the church. Did one person, the Pope, really have ultimate authority, second only to God? Or should there be collegiality in church governance? And no one person has ultimate authority over this thing we call church. Now, there were theological differences as well, because earlier still, in the 8th and ninth century, there were more arguments, and the church was splitting over icons. Did icons or images or monuments and statues, did they belong in churches or worship? People argued that having an icon or a statue or a painting was the equivalent of idolatry. And this act argument, this argument actually resurfaced just after the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century, and it led to even more denominational splits as well. Who was right? Who was wrong? Hmm. Let's turn back to scripture because Paul goes on and uses the Sabbath day as an example. One person considers one day more sacred than another and another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. And so here Paul's using the theological debate of the holy days. Is Sunday more sacred than Saturday? But notice how Paul is actually generous to both sides. Right there, Paul has stated that both sides of these arguments are pleasing to the Lord. Whoever regards one day does so to the Lord. And so both sides are exercising their freedoms in the freedom to choose. And so, in other words, both the weak and the strong can please the Lord even while holding different viewpoints. In other words, these different positions have the same motivation to please God, to honor God. What if everyone gave each other the benefit of the doubt when it comes to honoring God? Hmm. Now, since is the, this is the day that our North American culture honors the tradition of Father's Day, so we do say Happy Father's Day to all those fathers and all those in fatherly roles. But I'll ask a question here. Have you ever had a disagreement with your father? Have you ever not seen eye to eye on an issue? When you disagreed, did that mean that your father didn't love you? Or that you didn't love your father? Probably not. The answer would be no. And you know what? Even today, I don't always agree with my own children or even their choices, but that does not mean that I don't love them. And so the same holds true with our Heavenly Father. We, yeah, we humans, we may not always make the right choices even when we do seek to honor and glorify God. But that does not mean that God doesn't love us. That does not mean that God won't walk with us or journey with us or even point us in the right direction. Perhaps you've heard me say that God can't love you any more than God loves you right now. And nothing that you've done or nothing you can do can make God love you any less. Hmm. So no matter what we do or may not do, may we truly do it for the honor and glory of God. May we do so to the Lord. You think about that. Alleluia and Amen.
So I invite us to pray together. And when you hear me say, God in your mercy, I invite you to respond, hear our prayer. So let's pray. God in whom we live and move and have our being. As we consider the world around us in your presence today, we are grateful to know you are near and that your presence will not fail us, no matter the challenges or the differences we may face. We are aware of so many challenges in our own lives, the lives of those we care about and in the world around us. We wonder how, how will you reveal yourself, your mercy, and your love in response to so many different needs. Help us, Lord, to trust that you never give up on situations, even those that we may find overwhelming. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. In our faithful silence, we lay before you the concerns on our hearts this day. We pray for those who've been in the headlines this week. We pray for those, those situations which concern us and move us so deeply. We pray for all whose lives cry out to you for help in situations we can't even imagine. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for those who are suffering from illness of any sort, those who are coping with pain or with ongoing treatment, for those waiting for or recovering from surgery and procedures. We pray for those who are bereaved or burdened by loss. We pray for those struggling with hardships in these uncertain times. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for those who are waiting for something significant, whether it's a birth or even a death, a trip, a visit, or even a phone call on Father's Day. Those who are waiting for a move, those who have settled into new homes, those who are waiting for a new job, or even the moment of retirement. Grant them patience, O oh Lord, in this time of restless waiting. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for the work of our church and our government in pursuing truth and reconciliation with Canada's Indigenous peoples. Empower this work, O oh Lord. Help us to be compassionate. Help us to listen. Help us to heal. We pray for our denomination with the recent decisions. May calm and compassionate hearts prevail even in the midst of our disagreements. We ask that you bless our congregation, its ministries, and the faithful work of all the churches in our community. Unite us in our witness to the love of Jesus. Help us to bring that good news of the gospel to all. Open the eyes of all of our hearts to new possibilities to serve together. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And so we unite our voices in that perfect prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And so we thank you again for joining us in these virtual times from your safe space. <sighs> yes, it can be tough 
to get along. We are just people. We're an imperfect people gathered together following a perfect Lord. So as you head out into the rest of your day, into the rest of your week, may you be blessed and refreshed. May you be a little less stressed, my friends. May you know that God's not mad at you. God doesn't love you any less in this moment. And God doesn't love you any more. God's love is perfect and full and complete. May you know that you are a beloved child of God, that you are part of this wonderful thing called a faith family, and we're so glad you're a part of it. May you see the face of Christ in everyone you meet, and may everyone you meet see the face of Christ in you. Go in peace, go in hope, but above all things, my friends, go in love. Amen. <laughs>